Hello people of the internet, welcome to episode 25 of Paint to Life, the YouTube channel where we take tiny plastic miniatures, throw some acrylic paint on them, and breathe life in them with storytelling so you might learn something new on the subject or take them and make them your own for your own campaign. If this is your first time here, welcome. If you like my content and storytelling, please like and subscribe to help us grow the channel. Also, the painting video that plays up here during the episode can be found released on Tuesday with commentary of how I did certain things if you want to follow along. If you're a returning visitor, welcome back, friends. I'm GMA Tank. Let's get painting. All right, last week we painted the Norzel's Marvelous Manticore and learned the story of Leonidas. If you missed that episode, I suggest you check it out. You can find it in the link here if your browser supports it before the circus leaves town. Last week I finished by asking which mini we should paint next, the ogre zombie or the giant spider with egg clutch. And from the comments in the video and the emails I received, giant spider it is. Now I know all of you know what a spider is. Depending on where you live, they could be as big as this, or as big as this. <laughs> now, some spiders are harmless little guys that couldn't kill a fly. No, wait. Some spiders are harmless little guys that couldn't kill a turkey. With the over 43,000 spider species on Earth, only a small number of that, about 30, are said to be dangerous to humans. Of course, that didn't stop my friends in Australia from shaking out their shoes and checking before they put them on. And I get it. Australia's a pretty crazy place. For Dungeons & Dragons, spiders take on a more adversarial role than they do in Earth for adventurers, given the nature of their professions. Monstrous spiders haunt the dark places of the world. The largest of these can be the size of elephants. They can be found in almost any environment. Dark forests, sandy deserts, dark caverns, under dark passages, just to name a few. Also, in the Forgotten Realms Faerun, spiders are servants of the evil goddess Lolth. Since these are her holy creatures, the drow that revere her are afraid to crush or sweep away even the most common spiders, believing that such creatures might be serving Lolth's purposes and they don't want to get on her bad side. Now as a dungeon master, spiders are great low level enemies. They have a great web ability that can make for a very dynamic battlefield, especially if there are multiple spiders squirting that shit around during a fight. Also the venom inflicted in their bite is extremely effective as it does a great deal of damage versus low level characters but does not kill them outright. It self stabilizes them at zero, basically granting players a second life if they have bad rolls or make dumb decisions. Now as a player, if you encounter spiders in D&D, resist the urge to call your significant other to vacuum it up for you. Just think of it as a many-legged orb of eyes. Also remember that web is very flammable, uh, it has a vulnerability to fire, and ultimately they are animals, so you are able to likely scare them away with that same torch if you're confident enough to do so. But what about our spider? On the rundown streets of Wayshore, there was an eight-year-old homeless boy named James. His father had died in the Great War and his mother and sisters had recently succumbed to the plague that was ravaging the city. Now one afternoon, a young woman spotted him chewing on a piece of discarded leather that might have been an old belt. She took pity on him and introduced herself as Colette and offered him a job at her inn called the Stubborn Fox. Now Colette was very strict but fair and James began to work for his room and board, cleaning the stables and fetching ale from the cellar. She taught him to read and he would read whenever he could. Remember, readers are leaders, folks. He grew stronger and more able with every year that passed, and the two had like a mother-son relationship. Now a young teenager, the physically able young man was asked by Colette to descend into the cellar of the inn to investigate strange noises and the missing barkeep. He found the dead barkeep, as well as signs of an acidic bile in the far corner of the room with the earthen wall where the kegs were kept. Just then, a creature, an ank hag, having felt his vibrations, burst through the wall and attacked him. Now James deftly kicked out the leg of one of the casks of ale which broke, fell and rolled, pinning the exposed creature and allowing James to kill it with ease. Now behind the tunnels that it had been burrowing through, James discovered a small lair, and inside that had been collected over the years much wealth and possessions of all the people that the creature had been killing. With his newfound riches, James purchased Colette's inn from her lenders and deeded it to her, fully paid. He also made additional property investments in Wayshore. Years later, James got married. He had a son named Colton, and he became quite wealthy due to his sound investments, and ultimately he became the elected mayor of Wayshore. 
As mayor, things were prosperous. James routed the bandit problem that the city had. He lowered property taxes, established a city guard, and financially backed the introduction of a sewer system to the city. A decade or so later, James' grandson Lucius was born. Now, Lucius was a spoiled, whiny, arrogant little boy who wanted for nothing. He lived in a luxurious house, he was a fussy eater, never had any chores to do, never took any responsibility for anything anyone gave him. Now, when Lucius turned about 12, his father, Colton, passed away suddenly. And at the funeral, James actually overheard his grandson bragging to his friends about how he was halfway there to his inheritance. Now, enraged, James forced Lucius' mother to send him away to a private military boarding school in the neighboring province. He hoped that the discipline would correct the behavior that his parents had not. Now a teenager, Lucius returned to Wayshore for Christmas. A changed man, on the outside at least. All that boarding school had really taught him was how to properly scheme and behave without drawing the ire of other people. He had learned deception, intimidation, and above all, what his family name and wealth could buy him, anything he wanted, without even having to work for it. He had a lovely dinner with his mother and grandfather James. When he was ready to return to school, James, now retired as mayor, asked him for a favor. Lucius, my boy, please visit the inn called the Stubborn Fox. An old friend of mine lives there and she's very old. Please check in on her for me, please, would you? Lucius replied, of course, grandfather. My services will be hers at once. Now, traveling through the snow, he arrived at the inn, and he was immediately disgusted. It was run down, in serious need of repairs, and clearly had seen better days. The old woman, Colette, thanked him for coming. She was trying her best to run the inn, but she was worried it was getting too much for her. There were so many chores and things to do, and there were spiders everywhere. They seemed to be coming from the cellar, and she couldn't do anything about them. Lucius, internally, was disgusted with the prospect, but offered to take a look for the woman. Drawing his long sword and torch, he descended into the cellar. There were many cobwebs about, some cocooned in the shape and size of small animals such as cats, mice, and birds. And that's when he saw it, a massive spider about four feet wide. His torchlight reflected in its eight little eyes, and he lunged after it. Now Lucius had clumsily wounded the creature, and it fled in between two large casts where he could not follow. He would need to move one of the casks aside so that he could deliver a killing blow. I'm not about to get this filth on my good clothes or risk pulling a muscle in this shithole, he thought to himself. So instead, he returned upstairs and told Colette that he had vanquished the spider and that her problems would soon be gone. Almost two years later, having graduated and having purchased the rank of captain at such a young age, Lucius returned to Wayshore. Despite his rank and education, he knew he would never have to serve in the actual military due to his bad heel spurs. So, he would just return and wait for his mother to die so he could collect his inheritance, or perhaps he would travel the country and partake the benefits his esteemed military rank would provide him. While passing down the main drag atop his beautiful white horse wearing his elegant armor and clothes, Lucius saw his grandfather, preparing to post a notice atop the door on the boarded up and condemned in the stubborn fox. Grandfather, it is I, your grandson Lucius. What ill fate has befallen this damned place? Through tears, James told his grandson how recently Colette's body had been found dead, bitten many times by many spiders. Now Lucius vehemently lied to his grandfather. He suggested there must have been another spider down there that escaped his wrath, and vowed right there on the spot to descend into the depths again and slay every last living thing in there to honor Colette. For a mere 150 gold pieces, of course. Now see, now that he's an enlisted man, he didn't wish to set a precedent of doing charity work that would just never end. With an incredulous look, James looked upon the young man, about the same age and familiar in appearance as himself many decades earlier when he killed the Ankhag in this very place, not for money, but because it was the right thing to do. Very well, he told his grandson Lucius, and both men entered the building. James waited atop the stairs of the cellar as his grandson Lucius descended in the darkness, a torch in one hand and his beautiful longsword in the other. In the far corner of the room with the earthen wall, near where the kegs had been kept, Lucius spotted a giant spider, approximately six feet across. He cried out in disgust at the sight of the monstrosity, but knew it would be no match for him. The great spider backed away from the young man. 
This was the first time Lucius had actually fought anything with his equipment. He haphazardly swung his sword, and the spider, again, defensively retreated back further and further into the cellar. The spider ejected webbing from its thorax, which covered Lucius and all of his, his gear, entangling him, making him furious. Stop fleeing from me, you cowardly creature. I should have ended you the last time I was here, Lucius yelled. From atop the stairs, Lucius's words stung the idle James, whose suspicions of what had really happened to Colette had just been realized. A single tear ran down his cheek. As Lucius struggled in the sticky web, a piece of his shoulder armor fell off. His sword arm and sword got tangled up in his fancy white cape. He began to use the torch to set fire to the webbing, slowly freeing himself. The hefty arachnid finally turned around in its position, turning its back to the young man exposing his thorax. His torch then revealed to him a scene from a nightmare as the entire back of the creature began to break apart as hundreds of tiny little spiderlings, each the size of a human hand, had been riding atop of their mother and were now crawling off of her onto the web and towards Lucius. He screamed in terror and turned to flee, carelessly dropping his sword. He was bitten a few times in the legs and defensively stomped and crushed some spiderlings. The giant spider had turned back around to watch as he struggled through the webbing, racing back to the stairs, calling his grandfather's name. When James saw the boy appear at the bottom of the stairs, there were about six spiders on his body, biting at him. His face was puffy as the spider venom was causing a reaction and his eyes were full of tears and terror as he started up the stairs. James held on to the open door handle and simply said, I'm sorry, as he shut the massive oak door and latched it. Lucius' screams for aid had become muffled behind the door and soon grew silent. James walked back outside and took the white horse by the lead. He finished tacking the sign to the door that he had been working on when he had been interrupted by his grandson. The sign read, Beware, Spiders. Ariacne the Fertile. All right, let me know in the comments below what you thought of my story of Ariacne, the Fertile. Here she is for the shelf and her spiderlings on her back. My inspiration for tonight's episode comes from a quote from G. Michael Hoff. Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men and weak men create hard times. Anyways, it's a great time to pick up a brush and some paints and give miniature painting a try. Head on down to your friendly local gaming store, get yourself to your bare essentials, come back to Paint to Life and paint along with us. Some of the Norzels Marvelous Miniature Lines, a great entry level place to start and I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. Remember I release new videos every Saturday and the painting video with commentary on the subsequent Tuesday. You can find all of my content at my website painttolife.com. And that's all I have for you for now. We'll see you next week. I'm GMA Tank. Wash your hands people. screamed in terror and turned to flee, carelessly dropping his sword. <laughs>